banging and uh, careening off other cars and off the concrete. It's been one of those evenings here at Speed Room. And here's a replay of what happened. It occurred as the cars came off of corner number four. Well, it looked like Bigelow got bumped, or Eisenhower in car number six got bumped from the back, and he spun right in front of Reed. And you can watch Eisenhower in the yellow car. He gets bumped, turned almost sideways. He clips the uh, left front of the other car and slides across in front of uh, Barry. Barry has no place to go in that V6 Chevy, and so those two cars will be eliminated. A lot of damage to the right front suspension. There's a good picture of Sam Eisenhower from Lebanon, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. Well, Pepe Marchese's car was also uh, somewhat involved in that accident. It got up on two wheels, but he is still running. The wrecker is at the Sam Eisenhower car to get it off. There is Pepe Marchese, and he has pulled into the pit, so perhaps uh, there is a uh, tire flat on the car. That's... And Rich Vogler came on from his eighth starting position to take second position. So both Rock Morton and Rich Vogler transfer to the feature race. In the second feature, rather the second heat, I should say, it was Forbes Griffiths in the yellow and red number 15 battling with uh, Mac McClellan in number 2X, and Mac made the transfer position along with Michael Lang. So Lang and Mac McClellan, the two transfers to the feature from heat race number two. There's Mac McClellan from Vandalia, Ohio, who's going for the championship, and there is Michael Lang, who was the winner of heat race number two. In the third heat race, Ronnie Ambrose in car number 35 and Billy Humphreys in car number 77 battled to the very end, but Ambrose hung on for the win. And Billy Humphreys in the blue number 77 came home in second position. Heat race number four, it was John Murphy in car number 7S and Roger McCluskey in car number 51, finishing in second position, but he had to hold off a challenge from Tom Bigelow, but Roger McCluskey successfully did so. Winner of the race in car number 7S, John Murphy and Roger McCluskey Jr., car number 51, finished in second. Then in heat race number five, as we see John Murphy taking the checkered flag and winning, we had an incident down in turn number one in heat race number five, a spin. No serious problems, that was Bev Griffiths. And Rick Laughlin battled with the number 12 car of Ted Hines, and Ted went spinning to the infield. So Kevin Olson and Rick Laughlin were the first two finishers in heat race number five. The cars are assembled, and we will have the start of our last chance race from the Indianapolis Speed Room right after these messages. To anyone racing against us. <laughs> last chance race, 25 laps of USAC midget racing. And on the pole position for this race will be Palmer Crowell in car number 26. He's making his initial appearance here at the Indianapolis Speed Room tonight, and he's come all the way from Oregon to participate. In the race, this evening is the tonight. Green flag comes out, the race is on, and Crowell jumps out in the lead from his pole position with Pepe Marchese running in second and Tom D third. Positions changing at the rear of the field as the drivers Work both the high and low side of the racetrack. There is Deep running over one of those tires that mark the inside of the racetrack, but he holds on to that third position. Again, right now he has a pack right behind him, Bob, and probably is slowing that pack down. He has not been having it. The car has been pushing, and I would guess that oh, a big crash over there, and we almost have one right in the fence. That is Dennis Hurst, and boy, as he came back down to earth, he was hard on the binders. As you can see, the car sliding up there. You can see the tire marks as he capped off the fence. All he could see was grayish white as he headed for that outside concrete when he brought that car back down to earth. Well, he managed to stop the car before hitting the fence, but here's what happened over in turn number two. Watch the blue car to the high side of the racetrack. That's Dennis Hurst, number 91. Obviously, he runs over somebody. There's trouble in front of him, and a couple of cars slow down, and he gets into, uh, looks like Roy Carruthers in the five car, a low shot now off the uh, top of the wall. 
shooting into turn two, and look how high in the air he gets hard on the binder, sliding to a stop and keeps it off the wall. So Dennis Hurst will pull it to the infield and retire for the evening as we get set for the restart now. Islands. Thank you, Joe. Well, it looks like he may have been bumped from behind, but again, uh, a lot of things go on in the driver's head, and he's probably right now thinking about what he could have done to save the car and keep it from spinning, but it's too late now. The evening's over for Danny. And no start. Get the green this time. Yes, the green flag comes out. Two laps have been completed in this 25-lap last chance race. Palmer Crowell in the lead. Pepe Marchese in second position. Tom Deeth, the former hydroplane driver, is running in third. You can identify Deeth by that white orange helmet that he wears. And there's the number 43 car, Lonnie Adams, who's running in fourth spot just outside the transfer position. I asked Tom why he had given up the uh, unlimited, and he said, well, now, you know, they're enclosing that cockpit in a bubble, and the drivers are wearing seat belts, and he said, I don't want to be strapped to anything that can sink. So he gave up the boats, and now he's driving the midgets after a stint in Super V's. Well, apparently he's going full-time midget racing last year. He has received some sponsorship money from Barnall and from Budweiser, and so he is embarking on a uh, midget campaign full-time next year. That marks the return for Bardall. You'll recall Bardall in that black and white check car that Bobby Unser drove at the Speedway back in about 1967. Well, Bardall is back in the sponsorship business with the ETH here at the Speed Row. Boy, just some great racing going on here for positions back of ETH. He's holding on to third right now, but really uh, having some drivers breathe down his neck. They're three wide going into turn number one. Uh, Roy Carruthers is involved in this, so is Adams, and on the outside is Dale Bell in the blue number nine car. Now they get sorted out somewhat, but still, oh, and uh, Bell brushed the outside. Yes. Wall, coming in the front straightaway. Actually, the situation is this. Right now, these guys behind me are actually faster than Tom. Tom is holding them back just a bit, and these guys are having a great battle. Something's going to break in that back. There is Carruthers right behind me. But that's all you have to do is just keep your line on this one-fifth mile track, and you can hold back the competitors even though they are faster than you, and that's what Deeth is doing right now. But look at Roy Carruthers right behind him. Now Deeth gets sideways, Carruthers passes, and to the outside also goes Tom Bigelow. Now that was a mistake that Deeth made and allowed two drivers to pass him and moved him out of a final transfer position, so it's going to be a long way now for him to regain that ground. Oh, it's been right in the middle of the track over there. Two or three cars involved. What a melee coming off the second corner. There is I believe that Verdine. That's, that's Rick Verdine in car 48. We had a number of cars bouncing coming off the second turn there, getting airborne, but all settled back to earth and all in an upright position. So Rick Verdine is the only victim of this accident. He'll be pushed to the infield as we have 11 of 25 laps completed. Bobby Allen was also involved in that melee over there, although he continues on. I think Bob Ciccone in car 43 bounced around just a bit, but he continues on. No, several cars were up on two wheels as they tried to get around that spun car of Rick Verdine. We have a low angle uh, replay of what happened over there. Well, he's way out of the groove up there in the uh, marbles, as we say. He spins on around. Ciccone looks like he... Uh, is right between sandwich between two cars and that was the only shot we had but you can see what happens when a driver gets out of the groove on the high side it's very slick up there very slick what would be actually the third groove this evening and there's a good shot of bob Ciccone, who won those four features and three nights in three different states last weekend after driving here last thursday evening he's making some gestures to somebody down there well they moved kenneth nichols and number zero up to seven spot and dropped bob back to eighth and i don't think he particularly cares for that arrangement but for the moment, that's the way it's going to stand. Now the USAC officials are making a gesture and uh, trying to get the field realigned for this restart. Ciccone is going to stay in that eighth position, I believe, for the restart. What a bumping going down the back stretch now. Now Ciccone moves to the inside. Will they drop the green? No, the no. yellow stays out. Ciccone, corner number four for the restart, and the green flag comes out. It's a slow restart, and Tom Bigelow gets the move on. Roy Carruthers and both Carruthers and Bigelow slide into the wall. Bigelow uh, climbs out. Carruthers kind of throws his arms up, and Tom's not too happy. No, he now, this is very uncharacteristic of Tom Bigelow. As he, uh, oh boy, we don't expect to see that from Tom, but he's having a conversation right now with young Roy. Whoa, look at this! And obviously, Roy said something back to him. We're guessing as he grabs, and uh, the USAC officials are not going to look kindly onto this little altercation here. 
And well, very, very uncharacteristic of Tom Bigelow. It really is. Uh, Tom obviously disgusted with Roy Carruthers. Maybe Tom we can see on a, on a replay here, fortunately, uh, if we have it, exactly what happened because uh, Tom, uh, well, here it is. Tom's on the inside. Roy comes down and just kind of slams the door on him. So Tom was alongside and really had a position on the inside. It looked like Roy may have come across, perhaps slammed the door. Maybe we can see that again to take another look at it. But uh, Tom very, very upset. Yeah, now, we don't know if uh, Roy said something back to him from the cockpit as the two cars are hooked together there. Yeah, the cars are hooked together. Bigelow now down on uh, his knees trying to get this car separated from Roy Carruthers. You'll notice that Roy still has the helmet on and he's still sitting in the car. And at this moment, I think that's probably a wise decision on his part. Yeah, anytime a driver gets an altercation, leave your helmet on. <laughs> Bigelow has taken his off and there is Tom pushing his car into the infield. But boy, I'll tell you, Tom was uh, as angry as I've ever seen Tom Bigelow in any kind of racing. He's I've never seen uh, Tom that angry. Yeah, usually has a very cool head and uh, maintains his composure, but obviously he was not happy with Roy Carruthers. And probably within 10 or 15 minutes, he'll walk back to the paddock area and think, why did I do that on national <laughs> television? And uh, they'll probably have a conversation later on and it won't be quite as heated as what we saw there. Still 11 laps completed. Now here's what happened. We take it back to turn number four as the yellow flag, as, rather as the green flag is coming out for the restart. There is Tom cutting to the inside of Roy. Tom has position now and Roy just really slams the door on him and the two get together. Uh, just really two cars trying to occupy the same space. But uh, Roy came high coming off that fourth corner. Tom was able to sneak down on the inside. And that's what happened as they went into turn one. Well, we're back to live action now and he's just back up to third position and that's right on the backstretch by Nichols at number zero. That's that battle for the third and final transfer position. Nichols to the outside, but can't make the pass in turns three and four. We'll see what happens here in one and two as he again goes to the high side. This time he passes deep, and Kenneth Nichols moves into that third and final transfer position. Ahead of him, the number five car of Pepe Marchese, and running in the lead, running in the field is Carlos Brown. And now Nichols to the outside of Marchese, and Kenneth Nichols takes second position. Nichols dirt tracking through the fourth turn. That's how slick it is there once they get on that inside groove. Both hold on, though, maintain control of their cars. And now uh, Kenneth Nichols has about a full straightaway to make up between him and the leader, Paul McGraw. But he's satisfied where he is. He's in a transfer position. And so is Pepe Marchese back in third position. But there is quite a battle going on back for third spot behind this car driven by Kenneth Nichols. I see Kenneth Nichols reaching down. He's getting the weight jacker bar. Adjusting the weight, transferring weight in the cockpit to make the car handle differently. Each time down the straightaway, he's reaching down to make an adjustment. There's the battle for third position. Bobby Allen in the red car goes to the inside of Marchese and picks up the spot. Coming along behind is Bob Ciccone at car number 43. So now Bobby Allen also has a transfer position, but Bob Ciccone would like very much to have third and make this feature race here this evening. Now we still have six laps to go, and Ciccone has behind Bobby Allen as they're going by a slower car as they roll into turn three and the car stays up on the high side. That car is Larry Urban who is running well off the pace and staying out of the groove on the high side of the racetrack. There is the interval between the third and fourth place car as Palmer Crowell continues to set the pace. There he is headed into turn number three. Well, over a full straightaway advantage now between first and second. There is uh, Kenneth Nichols in second position, still making some chassis adjustments. And there's the third and final transfer position, Bobby Allen in car 53. But Bob Ciccone is definitely catching Bobby Allen. The question is, does he have enough laps left? This completes lap number 23, only two more to go. Ciccone will not have enough time to close this down. Bobby Allen should make a mistake. Here comes the white flag for Palmer Crowell. He takes the white flag. He's on his last lap of this 25-lap event. It looks as if it's going to be Crowell, Kenneth Nichols, and Bobby Allen going to the 100-lapper. Here's the checkered flag. Crowell wins it. Second position out of turn number four, Kenneth Nichols, and third, Bobby Allen. Those three go to the feature and... The others pack it up for the evening, including Bob Ciccone and Blake Collingsworth. Both of those drivers have been victorious in feature races here at the Speedrome this year. 
So those are the preliminaries. And now, in just a few moments, we'll have other shorter races. I, over the course of these televised races, have called this a patience track. You can't win it on the first lap. And obviously, you'll be going from somewhere near the back of the pack. You have to use some patience. Well, this particular racetrack, especially tonight, it seems like it's one of those uh, nights where we're having a little uh, slippery racetrack. Here, to go fast, you need to go slow. Uh, it's, it, it's, I have to tell myself that when I'm out on the racetrack, because I like the uh, Winchester and Eldora racetracks where to go fast, you run wide open all the way around. But here, you have to go slow. You have to make the car hook up to the track with your, uh, with your right foot, the gas pedal, and also your left foot with the brakes. So it's going to be an interesting race tonight. And an interesting comment for Rich, you have to go slow to go fast. It's an interesting comment. Well, you get yourself in trouble in this racetrack here, going a little too hot, perhaps trying to outbreak somebody. And obviously, uh, he has to stay close to McClellan and keep an eye on McClellan. I think we may get the green flag, Bob. Yes, we are racing 100 laps. Kevin Olson and Ronnie Ambrose are on the front row. They go in side by side to turn number two, and Ambrose grabs the lead as they go down the back stretch. Kevin Olson in that Badger style car, the lay down roadster type, but he's back to second position already. Forbes Griffiths is running in third spot, and Billy Rockport is in fourth as they begin to pull away from the rest of the field, and the other members of the field run side by side and two abreast through the corners trying to find their position. Well, right now, Ambrose, who has locked up the team in the championship back here in the Midwest, has a, a widening gap. Remember, it's very unlikely we'll go 100 laps without a yellow, so that would certainly erase that large gap that Ambrose is trying to owned by Merrill Calvert, who is a commercial airlines pilot and also a race driver. So it's unusual that one race car driver owner would let another driver show for his car. That's what's happening here this evening. There's the racing back in the pack. Roger McCluskey Jr. in car number 51 is involved in the race with Michael Lang on the outside in car number 97. Ahead of them is the number two car, driven by Kevin Potter. Well, Lang's on the high side of John Murphy, and what a, a fine job John Murphy has done over the last two seasons. He has really gained experience. He has smoothed out and is doing so much better this year than he was in his rookie season one year ago. And right now, he's on the inside. Michael Lang uh, has really improved over the past couple of seasons after making the move from go-karts to full-size midgets. And he's working that outside groove, and look at this. Look at this. A pair of deuces, nose to tail, and McClellan is right in front of Bozler. McClellan, the black deuce, the Holman Motors car out of Cincinnati, clips the tire, and the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken red number two right behind him. They've got Chris Brent on the high side. They go by Chris, the young lady from Cincinnati, and they are still right together. So right now, Bogler has McClellan really where he would like to have him because he can see exactly where he is. And remember, the only way McClellan can beat Bogler for the championship is to win the race and have Bogler finish third or worse. Mac has moved up to 11th position, and Bogler is in 12th as the uh, leaders now become somewhat bunched. Here is Kevin Olson really closing in now Ron Ambrose and Olsen in that laydown style midget is really putting some heat on Ambrose into turn number four. And Ambrose trying to pass but is unable to do so. This is a good battle for the lead. They have about a half a lap lead on the third place machine, which is driven by Forbes Griffiths. Well, we talked to Olson just a week ago about this chassis. And as we said earlier tonight, this chassis is just ideal for a tight pavement track like this. And Olson was very, very happy with the way the car was handling a week ago. But then in the uh, feature, he kind of backpedaled. The handling went away and he backed up. But right now, he's at the front of the back, only one spot out of the lead. And now they're heading into uh, traffic. So we'll see exactly what the veteran Olson can do in the Badger against uh, Ambrose, who is a consistent uh, TQ midget champion as they near the back of the pack, and that is another badger they're about to uh, lap as they move up on uh, Ron McLean. There is McLean in the yellow car as Ambrose, the leader of the race, and Olsen approach him. Let's see how they handle him down the back stretch. McLean goes inside, and the faster cars go to the outside of the racetrack and make a clean pass. The next car they will be lapping is the number 16 machine driven by Wayne Woodward. That's the Offenhauser-powered car. And many years ago, the only thing that you saw in this type of race car was an Alfi, and now it's uh, extremely rare. Well, the Alfies came in in the early 40s, about 1941-42. In fact, on September the 9th, 
Speed Run will celebrate its 45th anniversary. It opened September 9th, 1941. A guy named Ted Hartley won the 25 lap feature. Many, many years later, back in the 60s, his son, Gene Hartley, became a part owner of the Speed Run with another midget chauffeur in Leroy Warner. A little history. Now Ambrose begins to stretch it out just a little bit. We go back and pick up on this battle involving three number twos. That is uh, Mac McClellan in the black number two, also Rich Vogler, and behind Vogler is another number two, and that's driven by Steve Watshaw. Now the other number two, I think, is Potter. We have four number twos okay, here, Bob. Right. Yeah, that's Potter in the blue and white car, and uh, Lotshaw is in that other black and uh, white number two. Lotshaw is moving up through traffic, but he's still running in the pack behind this one. That is lying in 97 on the high side of Forbes Griffiths. That is the uh, part of the husband-wife combination that uh, races here at the speed rail. And once again, he stays on the high side. As the lead is now being fought for, again, a slower car involved in the mix. That's Palmer Crowell, but Kevin Olsen there for a moment was right alongside the leader, Ronnie Ambrose, and they still have not lapped the slower car, Palmer Crowell. Well, once again, we'll see which one of these drivers can work the traffic the best this evening, and both are very experienced. Yellow flag. Yellow is well, we out. look around the track and we cannot see why the yellow and perhaps they think somebody is oiling and they'll uh, check that particular car. USAC reserves that right to go yellow. So we have 25 laps completed a quarter of this race and Ronnie Ambrose is leading at the moment. We'll be back after this message. Come Another car backs in a bunch of. There's Mel Kenyon. There is car 51 uh, McCluskey. Well, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cars that have spun and uh, stopped down in turn number one. This is going to take a while to get sorted out. Now the rules in uh, 100 lap competition say you can be restarted one time. Here's well, let's see if we can pick up what happened. It looks like Throckmorton has already lost it. Perhaps he got tapped from the rear and that's an unlikely place to spin as he spins up toward the wall and car 17, that would be uh, Sandy. In uh, car 17, he slides around. Another car headed for the fence. That's Ron Glidden in car 15. And look how many cars we've got going the wrong direction here. And from the low angle in turn number one, another replay. Well, there's Throckmorton. He's the first to spin. There's car 22. Now we'll see car 17 come into the shot. That will be Dwayne Sandy. He backs into the fence and a sudden jolt there. And there's car 51. And up just a bit. Uh, well, now we go back to a, a live shot of Kenyon in car number one. And that he's still in the car. But Roger McCluskey Jr. is out of the car. So they're beginning to separate those cars. A flat left rear on car 51. So we are under yellow again, still only 24 laps completed. Back in a moment at the speed roll. Sure, you're performing. Identical to the point of being coilover cars. They're not four bars like most of the midgets. They're coilovers. Two 35s are leading this race, running in first and second. And they go through, and they all begin to slide in the single. Oh, upside down here on the main straightaway. That's Kenneth Nichols. He overturned several times coming down the main straightaway, obviously making contact with a car. And we can see some movement turn. there in the cockpit. And uh, he motions to one of the USAC officials. And he wants them to roll the car back over. Obviously, he does not know what the damage is like up in front. There's no way it'll continue. But he wants them to roll the car over before he even attempts to crawl out. Notice how gently they're uh, turning the car upright. But Kenneth looks to be in good shape. He's uh, doesn't look to be too happy either right now. <laughs> He's unhooking uh, the straps and about to climb out of the car. Here's a replay. Well, we catch it in motion right there. We can't see exactly who he tangled with on the inside. Bobby Allen has spun around on that's that red 53 car as the car comes to rest upside down again on top of that full cage that protects these drivers. A safety device that came into uh, midget and sprint car racing back in the late 60s. And Nichols is OK, sporting that new growth of beard. He said he's just had too much work to do and not enough time to shave. And right now, he's a little shaken, a little upset, but he's OK. The red flag, needless to say, has come out while we did have this uh, accident here on the main straightaway. So another delay. Back with more in just a moment. 
Back at the Speed Room in Indianapolis, we're looking at the number 53 car driven by Bobby Allen, and Allen was the car that Kenneth Nichols had contact with, causing the Nichols flip, and we have a much better angle of it low in turn number one. It looks like something may have broken on Allen. He was very, very high coming uh, out of uh, four, up against the wall, cut back across the track, and he was the ramp for Nichols, and I can't imagine Bobby just driving back across the uh, grain of the track like that. Apparently something broke on that race car, and again, Nichols had no place to go and used the 53 car as a ramp, and you can see the damage on the left rear of uh, the car as Bobby uh, walks around a bit disgruntled, but again, you can see why they have those what we call sissy bars on the side of the cage. It keeps a car, it keeps a wheel out of the cockpit. The uh, roll cage did its job, certainly. He came down hard on that cage, but it held right up there for him, and Kenneth Nichols was quickly out of the car when it came to uh, rest, and they got it righted again. Well, there is the driver who was the fastest qualifier for the Indy Midget 500 one year ago, and he and Warren Mockler, his co-driver, finished. Race fans will recognize the black and white number two of Steve Lotshaw. But under the hood of the family-owned midget, directly behind the radiator, is the reusable Holberg oil filter. A similar unit is also used in stock cars and dragsters. Old-style filters are used and discarded. But the Allberg filter allows the mechanic to pull the unit apart, actually seeing the dirt inside, then cleaning the filter and reusing it. Back to live action now at the Speed Room as the cars continue to be pushed off. There's Wayne Woodward getting shoved away. Palmer Crowell there in that blue and red machine getting ready to go. And there is the leader of the race, Ronnie Ambrose, who has yet to be pushed off. We'll take another break and be back with more USAC Jolly Rancher Midget Racing. Gary Lee back at the Indianapolis Speed Room. There are the top five with 24 out of 100 laps completed. Ron Ambrose, Kevin Olson, Billy Humphreys, Michael Lang, and Matt McClellan. Well, for you fans of Dwayne Sandy, we said earlier that under a yellow, a tire could not be changed. Well, under the red, it can be. So he did not lose a lap because we did not even complete a lap between that yellow and the red. So consequently, uh, we will see that Dwayne Sandy in car 17 will resume competition from the back of the pack. We're also getting some information from USAC that apparently something broke in the steering of Bobby Allen that caused him to come back across the track. We had intimated earlier that apparently something did break as he veered across the, uh, the fast groove right in front of uh, Nichols and used uh, that car 53 as a ramp to get uh, Nichols airborne. So uh, again, the report is that something apparently broke in the steering of Bobby Allen's car 53 that triggered that accident. Yellow flag is still out now. The guys who are going for the points championship here, Mac McClellan and Rich Vogler are running right together on the racetrack. McClellan is in fifth and uh, Vogler is in sixth. Well, again, Vogler, to win the championship, could stay right where he is now as long as Mac stays where he is. But Mac, to win the championship, would have to win this race and Vogler finish third or worse. So right now, Vogler is going to stay right with McClellan. McClellan is tucked in behind Michael Lang. So third, fourth, and fifth are right together, but they have a lap car out in front of them. Obviously, we're going over our assigned time. It's uh, 11.30 Eastern time. Sports Center will be on right after we complete this race in a crash or at least a spin. Cars getting together right at the finish line, the start line, but both of them go into the infield and the green stays out so we continue to race Woodward in car 16 that's the off the uh, went through the infield so he will be assessed a one lap penalty for cutting a marker tire while Billy Humphreys the other driver involved that light blue 77 just parked at the infield there is Billy Humphreys who he was third place was running in the third position but now Carson that moves Michael Lang up to third. There he is in the black car running behind Kevin Olson and Ron Ambrose. And now we have both McClellan and Vogler right in the thick of things here. The first five cars running right together on the racetrack. Well, you saw Michael Lang go through two on the high side. He wanted to get uh, on the outside of that midget, that little Badger Roadster, but couldn't get it done. A little slick on the outside. A lot of oil out there. Oh, your leader slips. Second place makes a move on the inside, but can't get the job done. Ambrose continues to lead in the upright 35. The lay down roadster number 35 of Olsen is still second. Lang is still third. 
97 points. The black number two of McClellan. And fifth, the red number two of Vogler. And a big gap between fifth and sixth. Almost a straightaway as your first five are together. Notice the tail on the racetrack. Now it's going to be interesting to see who is impatient here. When you get impatient, you try the outside line, thinking that you can get around your uh, nearest competitor up front. And the times that we have seen that happen this evening, that has been the wrong move, because then the guy behind you sneaks down to the inside. Look at the... Uh, and there goes Olsen on Kevin the high side. Car. See, he, he just gets out of position. Michael Lang sneaks into the inside, and for the moment, goes into second spot. That's how it's done. Well, once again, to make a move on the outside of this racetrack, you have to commit yourself to perhaps run there for a lap or two on the outside. There's the possibility you get hung up on the outside and the freight train goes by underneath. But Lang makes a nice move on the inside, moves up to second position, and now they have McLean up there as a bumper car to go around, but he moves to the inside. The freight train passes by on the high side, so McLean drops another lap down. Their leader remains to be uh, Ambrose. Second now is car 97, Michael Lang. You recall earlier in a televised race here at the speed room, Lang was second, then he was leading the race. McClellan came up, made a late pass, and won it. So Lang is hungry to win one here on national television. Now battle for second once again as Kevin Olson challenges Lang for that second position as Olson got his nose to the inside. He's still in that position, but no, he cannot take the spot. Mac McClellan moves to the high side of the racetrack. Now Ambrose, rather Olson, stands on the gas and moves into second position, just blasting by that second position car and going in two seconds. So that drops Michael Lang back to third. Well, Lang has dropped back to fifth now, and as McClellan went by, he pointed to Lang, indicating maybe that car is uh, a flat left rear tire, we are being told. That is why McClellan, in a sportsmanlike gesture, pointed to Lang, trying to get Lang's attention. Now, Lang looks back at that left rear, and how far can he go with a flat left rear? So the standings have changed this spin down in turn one involving Kevin Olson. And everybody gets by, but it's a miracle because the uh, yellow flag and the yellow light had not gone on, and the drivers were going through turns one and two, full four. Well, Lang stays out there. There's a good shot of the uh, driver that spun out, Olsen. And there it is right in front of McClellan and Vogler. Ooh. And he parks it right in the middle of that uh, groove, and Lang stays out in the 97 car with that flat left rear. There is Michael Lang at number 97 who was looking so strong, but then the left rear went flat and you can see that uh, it is definitely flat. Well, he's gonna pull to the inside and uh, that's the best thing to do. We saw this happen uh, last year. Vogler restarted after a yellow with a flat tire and ran about three or four laps of the flat tire and finally got uh, upset over there in the uh, third corner got very squirrely and caused uh, an accident over there so it's not wise at all to try to run even though uh, with the torque if you've got a flat left front you can torque the car enough with the throttle to keep the left front off the pavement really uh, there's no way one should be out there with a flat tire well in the first six positions we have four number twos <laughs> mac mcclellan is second in number two rich vogler is third in number two Steve Lotshaw is fourth in number two, and sixth is Kevin Potter, who is in number two. And there's a replay of this bit. It just looked like Olsen got into some oil that time and looped it. Uh, there, there was no tire smoke, as though we were going to the corner too hot and hot on the binders too hard. Green flag comes back out. 38 laps have been completed, not quite halfway through this 100 lapper that will cap off the season of regional midget racing here at the Indianapolis Speed Road. Ron Ambrose doing a fine job of staving off the challenges of both Mac McClellan and Rich Vogler and Steve Lockshaw. They go down the backstretch, nose to tail, and patience is the key word right now for Vogler and McClellan. Well, right now, Vogler is simply watching Mac. He knows that if Mac goes around Ambrose, then Vogler has to get around Ambrose. He has to finish second to McClellan. Vogler will let McClellan win the race yeah. as long as he, and there's a Christine Breen, Car number 14 loops it uh, up there in the apex of one and two. But once again, McClellan can win the race. Vogel will let him win it as long as Vogel can uh, be in second position. Well, I, you hear Rich Vogler say every time he straps on a race car, midgets on this track against full-size midgets. A perennial TQ midget champion as the green is flying, and we are racing again on lap 41. 
little bumping going on. Uh, Mac McClellan just uh, moved up and bumped Ronnie Ambrose on the tail end of the car, saying, Ronnie, I'm here. I would like very much for you to uh, move out of the way and let me around so I can win this thing. But, of course, Ambrose is hanging right in there, keeping his line and continuing to lead this 100 lapper. With that electronic scoreboard under the yellow flag, it shows the first four or five positions. And these drivers are rolling slow into turn one to glance up there. So I'm sure that at this point, Ronnie Ambrose knows that uh, Vogler and McClellan are right behind him and right behind Vogler is Lockshaw. So once again, three deuces in the first four positions. And back of uh, Lockshaw is John Murphy in car number seven. And then we have another two, Kevin Potter who is running in uh, sixth file. They continue to move in single file formation as we are nearing the halfway point of this race. Ambrose continuing to hold, but look at McClellan, look to the inside, but it is Ambrose that slams the door on him going into turn number one, not allowing Mac McClellan any room to pass. Well, Mac can still afford to be patient. It's really early in the race. We have yet to complete uh, half of this 100 lapper. Only working now on lap 47, so there's a good shot of the Lachau with the black helmet. McClellan can afford to be patient. And, of course, uh, Vogler can afford to be very patient. Just watch what Mac's going to try to do. Vogler has won the last two seasonal championships here at the Speedrome. He could go for an unprecedented third straight. McClellan would like to become a two-time winner. He won the inaugural championship back in 1981. That time we saw the leader a little squirrely down there in turn one, climb on the binders. Rearing got just a bit loose, but he uh, retains the lead, and he knows exactly who is back there in second position. Working now on lap 50, half the race will be complete this time by. And the leader at the halfway point is going to be Ron Ambrose. There he crosses the line and completes half of the race. McClellan goes high going into turn number one, but falls back into second position as Rich Vogler now begins to test the waters and see where he should move that car to move up a spot. Now Vogler to the inside, looking to the inside of Mac McClellan in turn number one, but they continue to run in the same order. It's almost like a bicycle race where they kind of psych each other out to the very last lap and then make a one lap dash out of it right now. And Vogler simply watching McClellan deciding uh, to do what he will do, determined by what McClellan does. And again, it's apparently a little slick out there on the inside, too, because we're seeing some uh, rear end getting loose on uh, car 35. There's the pass for the lead. We have a new leader coming down the back stretch. McClellan goes by on the outside. He was sizing up Ambrose. Ambrose had been loose for the past several laps on the inside. And there goes Bogler. Right now, Bogler can set on that position and win the championship. Max McClellan is the leader of the race, but now Rich Vogler is in second, and Ron Ambrose, who had led the first half of this race, is back to third spot. As the leaders approach some slower traffic once again, it'll be just a couple of laps before, before they will start lapping some of the slower cars, and that, perhaps, will uh, create some problems. They move to the high side in turn number two and pass Ronnie McLean once again and put a lap on him, and Wayne Woodward is next to be lapped in car number 16. Well, Vogler moves to the inside, now slides up on the high side of Woodward, goes by. He's not going to overextend himself right now because second place will mean the championship. Why do something that will endanger the car? If he loses that position, he could lose the title. There they are, McClellan and Vogler as Ronnie McLean pulls to the pit area and drops out of the race. The battle is for third position at the moment. It involves Ron Ambrose and Steve Lockshaw in another number two. There is Lockshaw following down the back stretch, but looking as if he could pass at any moment given the right opportunity. Well, again, he is very aware that Ambrose is loose in the corners, twitching just a bit. He's trying to get that nose down, get it to the inside to outbreak him and move Ambrose over in the corner. Now, we know that the other two deuces went by on the high side, but again, Lockshaw continues to look down low. He wants to pass on the inside. That uh, coilover car may not be working that well on the high side for Lockshaw this evening. Lockshaw, the 1979 USAC midget champion. He's been driving a, a number two midget for a lot of years. So now he's back to Steve Lockshaw. The points winner here in this series automatically gets an invitation to the... Uh, Hoosier Dome Invitational USAC Midget Race, which will be held in December of this year. That's held inside the Hoosier Dome when it's cold outside here in Indianapolis. Race fans gather to watch some midget racing indoors, and it's always a 
very good race and the points champion here at the in the regional series automatically gets an invitation to that invitational ambrose and steve lotshaw still battling for position as the yellow flag comes out a car is spun in turn number two on the inside of the racetrack that is eric moore in car 79 he brings out the yellow and you're talking about the bonuses as far as being invited to races there's a very interesting bonus that the track owner john styles presents if the winner of the seasonal championship, Ken Murphy, running in sixth position is Kevin Potter, then Mel Kenyon. He's in ninth position at the moment and uh, having a tough time moving up through the field. Green Fly comes out, racing once again. 64 laps completed. And Mac McClellan now really begins to pull away. He got quite a jump on Rich Vogler when the green came out. And has now about a half a straightaway advantage on Vogler. Back in uh, that third position, the battle continues between Ron Ambrose and Steve Lotshaw. Well, again, Vogler cannot receive a good hit sign from one of his crew members to indicate how big that gap is between second and third. Now, he may be able on a large track to hear the guy behind. A lot of time on a sprint car track, you can hear the guy come up from behind, but it's so noisy on a small track like this, it's very difficult to discern from hearing as to where the guy is behind or if he's back away. So right now, he has no idea as to what kind of a gap he has between second and third. And right now, Vogler did some sliding over there in the corner. That car is not handling all that well. There's that battle for third position to get Ambrose at 35 and Lotshaw at number two. Well, Steve is looking for Ambrose to just make a slight mistake because all he needs is about three or four inches and he can get his nose to the inside of Ambrose and take over that third position. But for the moment, Ambrose is continuing to hold the line and keep Steve back there in that fourth position. And John Murphy in car number seven is right behind Steve Watchell. So some good racing going on here. Mac McClellan is your leader and uh, Rich Vogler running in second position. But this is the scramble among several cars for that third position. Now Kenyon makes a move on the high side of Potter coming off the second corner down the back stretch. And he's still on the high side. Kenyon in that yellow car, Potter in the blue and white car. Now tucks in behind down the main straightaway. Now he pulls back out to turn one again. That's what we mean by being committed. Once you go to the outside, you may have to stay out there for two or three laps to actually make the pass. Well, it may work for Mel Hill. We'll continue to watch. He stays on the outside of uh, Potter, but they continue to run wheel to wheel. And as of the moment, Mel has not been able to pick up that position. There he is on the high side once again. He gets uh, his nose ahead, and there he does make the pass coming out of the fourth turn. So Mel Kenyon picks up the spot. I was looking over at uh, Vogler in that uh, number two car. It looks like Vogler may be smoking just a bit. So perhaps we can uh, check that out as the race progresses. 75 laps now complete, 25 laps to go. The man that's in second, Vogler, may be showing some signs of smoke. Let's watch him as he rounds the corner off what would be the uh, the left side of the race car. It could have been tire smoke earlier as he climbed on the brakes negotiating a turn. Well, there is second place Vogler, and there is your leader, the black number two. Moving into traffic now, there's the gap, the interval between first and second. 77 laps completed. Mac McClellan, the leader. Rich Vogler running in second position. And in third position is Steve Lotshaw. There is Mel Kenyon, who got a little wide in turn number one a few laps ago and allowed Kevin Potter. We have a spin over in turn number two. And Jack Dossie. That's the winner of uh, last week's 100 lapper here at the Speedrome. Jack Dossie Jr. spins in turn number two, bringing out another caution flag. He had too much body English that time, Bob. He was leaning in too far, and the car came on around on him. Knows how much headroom he has there between the top of the helmet and that roll cage. He uh, snugs down uh, nice and tight in that uh, cockpit. Graduate of the late model division, uh, was first in a midget on June 19th of this year, has... They, I don't think so. I think it they went pointed out. to Vogler and they pointed to somebody else. They pointed two cars. Vogler looked back over his right rear. Hmm. So let's see what might develop here. Well, maybe. Now what they'll do is bring him in. They'll check him over. And if he isn't leaking anything, then they'll send him right back out and put him in his second position. But Rich Vogler is going to stop and he's going to have his car checked by the USAC officials. Well, we had uh, intimated earlier that there might be some smoke from car number two. So they check him out. And Bob Timmy, the USAC official, says you're okay, go on back out there. So he will resume his position. That will be second 
behind McClellan. So again, we'll have the uh, three twos right at the head of the pack. I think they're also going to call comes out and the green is back. So we are racing once again as Mac McClellan leaves the pack and Rich Vogler continues to run second with Steve Lockshaw in third. Well, Lockshaw can be the spoiler right here because Lockshaw is well aware of what can happen if he should move in between McClellan and Vogler. He would actually, uh, he could determine who wins the championship right now. He's putting a little bit of heat on Rich Vogler. Steve Lockshaw, former champion of this division, is right on Rich Vogler's rear bumper. Still seeing some smoke from car number two, so uh, whatever is causing the smoke, apparently the car is not dropping oil on the racetrack. But again, Vogler is running second where he has to be to win the seasonal championship here at the Speedrome. But right now, car number two, that black number two Lotshaw there, could be the spoiler. He rides in third. Right now, about a half straightaway advantage for Mac McClellan down the back stretch as he leads as they work on lap 84. 16 laps to go now as he completes lap 84. Number two is leading, number two in second, and number two in third position. And uh, not too far behind all of this is uh, Kevin Potter, who is also in another number two. He currently is running in uh, seventh spot. Right now, Vogler is probably hearing every little noise and squeak that car is making out there because he knows where he has to finish. He is right at that position. He is aware after that last yellow that he has Lacho right behind him, and he also is aware that for some reason, USAC called him in. So perhaps he has some indication that uh, the car is smoking, and it's smoking more profusely now as we go back in the pack and pick up Mel Kenyon. Well, this is fourth through seventh, and Mel Kenyon continues to work to the high side of the racetrack. That's Ron Ambrose in number 35, Mel Kenyon in number one, John Murphy in number seven, Kevin Potter in number two, and then the number 12 car belonging to Ted Hines. Well, one thing that we can look for is some traffic to slow McClellan down. We have 11 laps to go. And before this race is over, we're going to have McClellan in traffic, which would give Vogler a chance to close up. And we stay on that battle uh, back in the pack, and there goes Kenyon on the high side as he maneuvers by trying to get around Ronnie Ambrose. So he moves into fourth position, and we have a car spun over in turn number three. That's Kevin Olson, who has looped at the end of the back stretch, bringing out a caution flag on lap number 90. Well, and he did it again, right in front of the leaders. The second time this evening that he's almost taken the leaders out with a slide. That's his second spin, so he will be moved to the infield. And a replay of it. There he is, right in front, right in front of your leader. But Mac fortunately takes to the uh, high side and evasive evasive action and misses Kevin Olson. And then you can see that Kevin is being pushed to the infield and he is going to be through for the evening. Well, Mel Kenyon had moved into that fourth position, but we go back to the previous lap. And so Mel is now in fifth spot, is going to have to pass Ambrose all over again. There's Mel, who's uh, working pretty good on the uh, top side of the racetrack. And now it will be interesting to see what Mr. Vogler can do if he is again content to let uh, Mac build up that sizable lead because he is aware now that Lotshaw is right behind him. And Lotshaw can play the spoiler. We cannot emphasize that enough that right now the entire uh, seasonal championship is riding not only in the hands of your leader, but in the hands of uh, Lotshaw. And look how quickly McClellan picks up the throttle coming down the backstretch. And look at that gap. There's something wrong, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Usak did not take kindly to that move. By no, Mac he didn't. McClellan. In fact, you know what happened? Vogler just did not pick up the throttle and kept the intact, because nobody could pass Vogler until he crosses the finish line. They go back to green, so they never went green. And now we have a good restart. A little cat and mouse game going on here. Vogler, as you can see, uh, moved to the inside, and McClellan then said, Mac, don't do that. Oh, we have a tangle over in turn one. Three cars involved, including Forbes Griffiths and number 15 and it looks like Ron Glidden in the other 15 right and I think we should probably order out for breakfast Bob because it'll be time for breakfast when we uh, conclude this 100 lapper this evening well again Sports Center will be on right and it looks like the uh, the yellow car the yellow and red car of uh, 
And that is Forbes Griffiths and uh, Glidden in the other 15 car. And there's a third car on the high side. Fly comes back out once again. 89 laps completed now. And only 11 more to go. Well, we think back one week, and Max said how important it was for him to win a week ago when he could not get by the rookie, Jack Dossie Jr. He finished second, and that second-place finish cost him probably the track championship this season because right now, even a win would still put him in second place. Mac could become our only two-time winner here on our televised regional midget racing. He won earlier this year and uh, is in line to win here tonight. Now, there is Mel Kenyon, who has not repassed Ron Ambrose. He had made the pass on Ambrose, but the yellow flag came out, and he had to go back. He's continuing to work on Ron, but just can't seem to have the muscle. Well, now we're down to seven laps to go, Bob. Seven laps and a half straightaway advantage between first and second. So right now, there goes uh, Kenyon on the high side. Let's get back. There's a shot of second and third places right there. Second place, the red car is Vogler. Third place is Lotshaw, and Vogler has his hands full right now because he has to finish second to clinch the title. Vogler just uh, trying everything he can to keep Steve Lotshaw in back. He will be hugging that inside line, making sure that Steve does not get the nose advantage that could take away that second position. Well, he's making that car as wide as a midget possibly can be, about 20 feet right out there now. And we're down to the last four laps, four laps to go. This will complete lap number 97 when Mac McClellan comes around. Look at Mel Kenyon. Look at Kenyon up there. He sticks his nose into the fray. That's the battle for second right there. That's the battle for the seasonal championship as far as Rich Vogler is concerned. We're down the last two and a half laps. Down the back stretch into three. Oh, oh, there goes Kenyon on the inside. What a beautiful move. That is how it's done. Mel just stood on the gas coming off the back stretch into turn three. He slid by uh, Steve Lotshaw, and we have the white flag out. One flag is out, but look at, look at Mel. Mel look at Mel. He may take the championship away from Rich Vogler here. Let's see McClellan if he can do it. Win it. McClellan Mac will win it, but here's the battle for second. Who's going to finish second? McClellan Who's going to take second? Oh, it looks like Mel. Oh, he bumps him out of the way. Who's going to take second? Mel Vogler wins at the championship. Steve Lotshaw finished second as he went around both Kenyon and Vogler. So Steve Lotshaw finishes second. Kenyon, I believe, got third and Vogler fourth. So Vogler loses the championship in the last quarter of a lap. also lost the right front tire, and here it is on the high side, right together now, and they get sideways coming off the corner, and Mel gets the outside wall as uh, Lotshaw was watching all the, the shenanigans in front of him. He dives to the inside and finishes second. Just an unbelievable finish to our regional series. As Steve Lotshaw, there he is. He's climbed out of his race car. He has finished in second position. He shot to the inside as Mel Kenyon and Rich Vogler were involved in a bit of a tangle. Mac McClellan, there he is. He's the winner of our 100-lap feature here at the Speedrome tonight. He is also the winner of the seasonal championship. That's unbelievable. Rich Vogler ran second, and all of a sudden, it disappeared on him, and he finished in fourth spot. So a disappointment for Rich Vogler, but Mac McClellan has won the regional championship here at the Indianapolis Speedrome. Well, Mac did exactly what he had to do. He had to win it. He didn't know what was going on behind him, and I'm sure he'd like to come up and take a look at the videotape of exactly what did happen behind him. There's the Piazak family out of Cincinnati with the congratulations, and there's a look at the top five. Mac McClellan, Steve Lotshaw, second. Mel Kenyon was third. Rich Vogler was fourth. And Ron Ambrose finished in fifth position. So a fitting uh, conclusion to our exciting five-race regional series that we televised here for you on ESPN. We invite you to join us for all the latest news from, from San Air Super Speedway near Montreal for the IndyCar race. Thank you for joining us for our regional midget racing here at the Speedrome. For Gary Lee, this is Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone.